everybody. Um, today we're going to learn about Morehouse Instrument Company um, and their drive to help create a safer world by helping you make better measurements. Uh, from its founding in 1920, uh, Morehouse has grown from a local machine shop to one of the most respected names in calibration and measurement right out of here in New York. Our speaker today is uh, Henry Zumbrun. Uh, Henry is a native of York, graduated from York Suburban High School uh, before he moved on and uh, received his dual degree from the University of Pittsburgh. It's no wonder uh, leadership comes out of that fine academic institution. So. <laughs> Hail Pitt. Upon graduation, he returned home and rose up through the ranks uh, to his present position. Um, I've known Henry probably about a quarter of a century now, if not more. Uh, and it's, uh, I can tell you that whatever he gets involved with, he is very passionate about. Um, he's a Six Sigma black belt and a lean champion. And he's been married to Marissa, has two sons, Harrison and Brett. And it's my pleasure to introduce my friend and uh, our speaker today, Henry Zumbra. James tells me that everybody will make a mass exodus in about 20 minutes. So try to follow that. I am very loquacious. Yes, I'm trying to bring that word back. So uh, let's bring it back. Uh, I can open with a really stupid joke, and I will do that because you know. So uh, why did this scarecrow win an award? Why? Because he was outstanding in his field. Yeah. Uh, corny. Told you I'm loquacious, corny, and, and everything else. I have this. Uh, Presented there. There's that guy before he grew a beard. Uh, I grow a beard in the summer just to be different. I'm going to shave it after next week because I promised my wife she hates the beard. Uh, so, yeah, I'm going to talk about our company. I am the fourth generation of our company. I have the fifth generation in our company. Uh, James helped with some of our uh, stuff this year. Uh, I'll give a little bit of a plug to him and his law firm. I uh, heard a lot about you know keeping things in the uh, family and overall. But so we're going to cover our history from the 1920s. We're going to talk uh, about why measurements matter. That is what I am passionate about because people don't realize why they matter. And uh, we're going to try to have some fun. Uh, I like to joke around. It eases the tension when you're up here, you know, talking to a bunch of people. Um, typically I like talking to people I don't know because I can do whatever and I don't care. But the people I know in this room, so it's a, that's, that adds a little bit of, adds a tiny bit of tension. James, I don't mind, but uh, the rest of them, <laughs> they don't mind him anyway. In fact, their goal is to get him out of here, I heard. So we're going we're gonna try to, try to try to ship him somewhere. Um, but so, back to the company and uh, things. There is a picture of my great-grandfather and Mr. Morehouse. This company started in the 1920s. I really wasn't sure where, when they started until we were digging through old records. When you're almost 100 years old, you have a lot of records. So we actually found one that said we started March 15th of 1920. I was like, wow, before then I just said, you know, 1920s. We didn't have a date. So we found that this year. And we found out this year that we're going to turn 100 next year, which is pretty cool. Um, so Morehouse, it was started as Morehouse Machine Company, developed and, and we direct we really developed and perfected instruments to calibrate uh, strength testing machines, but no one probably knows what that is. Um, so I'll, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that. If I get my notes here, I do have notes because I am forgetful. So, anyone want to guess what this is uh, to your right? It's a rack something. It's actually a boiler that blew up. And this was quite common back in the late, uh, late uh, 1800s and early 1900s. This was happening because people did not know the strength of material. When you, don't, when you do not know the strength of material, you do not know the, the forces that are exerted on that strength of material and if they will withstand it. So not knowing that resulted in several uh, catastrophic failures. Uh, several people were killed, and there was a need. Uh, that need specifically was develop a better instrument, and there we see it. The instrument on the right was the instrument they used to, to they put a 10 millimeter indent into material, but it wasn't accurate. It wasn't very good. It wasn't known very well. So in about the 19, uh, 1924, 25 NIST, which was NBS back then, the National Bureau of Standards, 
approached Morehouse Instrument Company, and we weren't picked magically because we were great or because my grandfather could, you know, get anything done around town. Someone knew somebody, a family member somewhere that said, hey, we have this machine shop in York, PA, Gaithersburg's pretty close, um, why don't we use them? And we did. Uh, we developed an instrument. The instrument would calibrate this machine to your right. Then you would know the exact force, um, or close to the exact force, to indent a 10 millimeter ball onto the material. That, that indentation was measured, and therefore you could calculate the strength of the material. Back in 1925, this uh, instrument was the greatest instrument known for measuring force. Nothing else existed for those that know force or, or may know it. Uh, nothing else ex existed and, and this saved a lot of people and allowed people to know the strength of material. In addition, the interesting part about knowing strength of material is I'm sure everybody in this no room knows about the Titanic, right? So what people do not realize is why it actually sank. I said Everybody's going to say hit an iceberg, right? But if you look at history, you look at the material that they used on this ship, about a week before it hit the iceberg, there was a fire on board. And the rivets weakened. And actually, NIST just published an article, which is the National Institute of Standard Technologies, that kind of correlate that weakening of that material and the impact of the iceberg to why it sank. So we don't know for sure. If the fire hadn't happened, would the Titanic have still sank? They did not derive a, a definitive conclusion, but the, some people think it may not have. So very, very interesting um, there. So there's a picture of our, it's really small, I apologize for that, and what we do. We're a manufacturing company. We, we really have three, three businesses. We resell, we manufacture, and we do calibration. So um, calibration there on the left is a picture of our dead weight machine. And on the right is our torque machine. So we do force and torque measurements primarily. Push and pull, twist and turn. So, and our purpose, um, you know, people say we create a better, you know, some people create a better world. We like to say we create a safer world by, by helping companies improve their force and torque measurements. So I did want to make... <coughs> So, I had, a, I had a thing I wanted to read about prolonged success, and I'm, ju I'm just going to add a little bit. You know, with prolonged success, people forget about things that matter. You know, people have been manufacturing things for, you know, 20 years, 25 years. They haven't had a failure. So then they start to neglect things that matter. And I'm going to start to talk about that in detail and show you some examples. And why this, you know, you're talking about uh, at the beginning, you know, everybody dies. Well, some people don't have to die. Um, you know, actually everybody has to die of old age, but some people don't have to die prematurely because of stupid things people do. And we're going to cover some of those. But let's understand a little bit about torque um, and why torque is important. And when torque, you know, the object of a threaded fastener is to clamp on parts together with tension greater than external forces tending to separate them. When the bolt is torqued properly, it remains under constant stress and is immune from fatigue. When somebody takes that, you know, people that, I'm sure they're NASCAR fans here, when somebody takes that, that bolt gun and puts it on a car, if they do not know that right torque, they can elongate a bolt. When they elongate a bolt, things like this happen. This guy got launched, you know, about 2,000, he was going, you know, 200 miles an hour, and he got launched in the air. Because somebody, that, the, the equipment used, elongated the bolt, it broke. Like I said, bad things start to happen. Um, Force measurement. This is this is more of my passion. Our business is 99% of force, so this is what I go out. I give lectures. I talk to people, do classes. Um, force is performed so routinely. People take it for granted. I mean, almost every item is material tested, or they're going to test some of the lot. I mean, we've gone to companies, Newark Paperbound, which is which is local. They're testing toilet paper. You know, the toilet paper holder. Who who? Things the cardboard and toilet paper is tested, but it's tested. They have to conform to some specification. Your paper towels, that cardboard is tested. So it just it just varies, um, you know. And then other things are tested, of course, that you noticed, like a bridge. What happens if we don't get the force measurement right? What can what can go wrong? We can have incorrect concrete strength measurement. We can have incorrect steel strength measurement. Cables not checked properly for pre-stress or post-tension. So. These are all things that can happen. What do, you, what do you think about this one? Do you ever know about the crane collapsing in Seattle and other ones? 
Well, this is people just doing stupid things. They're pulling pins out early. They're not supposed to do it, but it makes disassembly much, much easier. So when you see this on the news, these are people just legitimately not following the proper protocols. You know, you say it's an accident, but people do, like I said, I'm going to show more examples. People do stupid things, and it results in tragedy. This one, uh, anybody recognize this? It's a Texas refinery before and after the explosion. BP. And if anybody's interested in, like, disasters, I have to recommend the movie Deepwater Horizon because it is just a fantastic film. I want to rewatch it all the time by people just being greedy and doing stupid things that cause tremendous damage. This one is probably relates back to about a $400 uh, thing, a calibration, a $400 calibration that could have saved it. And the distillation tower and the attached... Uh, down drum overfilled, 7,600 gallons of liquid was released, and that was ignited by an idling diesel truck. Proximate cause, this is a 335 page report that you can read, and you know, I'm pulling the cliff notes out here for everyone. So uh, high level alarm malfunction, level transmitter miscalibrated, uh, there's an outdated 1975 data sheet, level transmitter indicated liquid level falling, and when the level was actually rising. So just stupid things. If they would have, they had workarounds. If they would have just got the proper calibration, used the proper instrumentation, it could have been prevented. This one, guess that one, bridge collapse. So, what do you think? Oh, the traffic was, uh, you know, stationary traffic. Da, 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 da. It was actually the gussets. The NTB cited the cause of the collapse, and it was a top thing gusset plate. So some engineering company, I can just see this, you can just envision it. Some company goes out, engineering, they bid on these gussets, low cost. Maybe it's tested, maybe it's not, so low, low cost. Someone says, oh, we'll supply the gussets, <laughs> heavy traffic, low gussets, not rated for the proper load, catastrophic failure. That's how things happen. Another one here, this is more recent in Miami, killing, it's, it's post this is a post-tension issue. So basically, they, they didn't they didn't have things tested properly, and they, they did something that was stupid with uh, post tensioning. Mm -hmm. This one this one I thank everybody in this room because we all paid for it. We we pay for most of these, you know you know we do. But this one anyone want to guess what that is? It's a two billion dollar mistake. Uh, it's a stealth bomber. So a mixture of water and fuel caused condensation. You can read that. Uh, they were unaware of this, calibrating wrong. The true story is there's a new tech. All the old people knew the workarounds of the procedure. New tech comes in, follows the procedure. Pilot goes to take off. Bomber crashes. Like I said, it's only two billion. We have that. We can spend them. So I'm going to poll everybody in the room. Uh, if if you know what this is, please raise your right hand. Okay. You guys know where this is going? If you know what this is, please raise your right hand. All right, everybody has an engineering degree and knows more than the people that made these stupid mistakes, really. And that is, that is the case. So this one gets a little bit harder in our business and it's directly related to what we do. I have a 10,000 pound device and I'm gonna apply you know, 5,000 pounds to it or 10,000 pounds to it. I used to just say 10,000. People say, what does it read at 5,000? I said, okay, I'll put it there. There's zero error in it. So, Anybody want to guess? We start talking about tolerances. I haven't really said much about tolerances, just about failures. Anyone want to guess? Is, is my device in tolerance? I have zero error, right? And right hand, everybody think that my device is in tolerance? Is this a trick question? You know, who, who thinks your device is in tolerance? No one's willing to raise their hand. So. Well, it all depends on how good the capability of the measurement, the person, the provider, the calibration provider is. So that, this is known as uncertainty. So I can say this device is intolerant, but when I graph it, you can see anything to the left and right of those red lines is risk. And that risk equates to why bad things happen sometimes as well. Because if you have a lot of risk, guess what happens? You know, you talk about producer's risk, consumer's risk. Anybody know the difference, producer's risk? You know, if something goes out, like on car manufacturer, it goes out and I have to issue a recall, that's producer's risk. That's going to harm you. Consumer's risk is, hell, I don't know. Stauffer's, great company, we're next door to them, smell their cookies all day long. I was once told, you know, uh, legal for trade, weight, 16 ounces on the bag, that they just overfill the bags a little bit. 
So if that is the case, if what I was told is correct, you should go buy Stouffer's because you can eat more than 16 ounces of animal cookies. <laughs> so that's consumer's risk. Um, or that's produ I'm sorry, that's, that's consumer's, that, that is producer's risk. I just feel more consumer's risk is, is, is when it goes to you. So, um, so that's my measurement risk area. So I equate this, would anyone trust a contractor who came out to your house and started measuring things with their arm? Yeah, that looks good. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna frame something, everything's in the house, this is perfect, so. You know, we talk about what uncertainty is, and that's our business, we deal with uncertainty. We deal with measurements that matter. So in, in the broadest term, uncertainty is doubt. You know, I doubt the validity of the measurement. It, you know, that's what it is. So you have large and you have small uncertainties. You have people out there that you think might calibrate your device, but they might have a large uncertainty and you know really do it with, with additional risk. So we look at this, um, the hierarchy, how things work, how measurement, this uncertainty, this traceability, measurement traceability. We start with SI units, we go down to your National Metrology Institutes, and then there sits our company. We're right under the NMI. And we are very, that pyramid, we have very, very low uncertainties here in York, PA. Which then I say, I extend anybody an invitation if they want to come out, not to sell us something, but if they're interested in what we do, they can come out too. Because I know some people knock on our door, hey, you want to buy something? So, but if they want, if they truly want to learn about this, our, our place is always open um, to come in, get a tour, see our dead weight frames, see, see what we do, see how it matters. Um, but the importance of this is measurement and certainty is, um, from the top to the bottom, every, every length in this chain gets larger. So the uncertainty gets larger. And what we're really talking about here is a large versus small uncertainty. It's going to allow for a proper acceptance limit. So when you send something into somebody and you know if they're, say if they're good or bad, if you send something to us, you know, being the third, third tier down on that pyramid, we have this much acceptance room. Other people have about that much. So it's anything in gray would be acceptable on that. I liken this to the car door. You know, in, in my youth I was a, a lot more spelt than I am today. You know, it's probably the beer. But uh, in fact, I know it's a beer. We, we don't even want a kid on that one. So I liken this to the car door scenario. You want to you use a lab with a, you know, a low uncertainty or a lab with a high uncertainty. Low uncertainty gives me room to get out of my car, put chairs in there, have a tailgate party at Penn State as, or, you know, at Penn State as Pitt beats them. But that never happens, so we'll, we'll just figure Penn State's going to win. Cause, you know. But I, can get, I have all this room. I'm not going to dig my car. If I have that smaller, if I have that larger uncertainty, my room gets less to be in tolerance. So then I'm going to get out. I'm most likely going to suck it in from the beer again. I'm going to suck that in, skimmy across, probably get you know, car dirt on my pants and everything else. So I'm sure everybody's been in that, that situation with the... Uh, with the cars and uh, parking close and having to really make an effort to get out of the car. So if we look at this graphically, this is what, what matters. There's us graphically. There's probably our closest competitor graphically. You start looking risk-based. The risk isn't that large in this example. It's 4.55%, but that's 4.55% that something's you know not in tolerance, that someone's saying something's good when it's not. That's too high. Look at it again, there's, there's it's related with, with that graph. And what we do, why it's important, I will start talking this, if people want to put it together, I, hopefully people put it together from the, the bridge and the other example. But in this industry, it's the difference between rockets a lot of times blowing up. I think everybody knows about the space shuttle. For some reason, I've seen that a lot more on TV recently, the Challenger. That blew up because of O-rings, you know, NASA, that was just purely humans. Uh, engineers did know about it. Uh, it was a cold launch. The O-rings, uh, the, the material of the O-rings were not, were not rated for that, for that weather. So, But in our business, if we don't get those weights right, we don't supply the equipment and get that right, that thing could blow up. SpaceX lost a rocket, uh, for sure. Or it could result in a wobbly satellite. We don't get the measurement right, and then the satellite wobbles. And if the satellite wobbles, it's not going to be that good to the person that paid the $100 million or $200 million to send it up in space. So. Things to, things to think about. Here's some examples. Um, I know this crowd's a little different. I was debating whether to put these in or not, but I, I did put them in. So here's some examples of what people do. Um, the one on the left, it's uh, proper pin diameter. We didn't really talk about adapters and the importance of them, but the one on the left is proper pin diameter. Uh, you load the device to 50,000 pounds and it reads 49,140. The one on the right is you're using the proper adapter and it reads 50,000 pounds. 
This is a device that the manufacturer claims should be accurate to within 0.1% of applied. Um, a full scale, actually, uh, plus or minus 50 pounds, and we have a 860 pound error from using the wrong pin. I can assure you that this happens all of the time. So it is a known problem. Uh, we go out, we try to educate people of these on about these errors so they do not make them. Another example here, uh, different hardness. Is, is anybody really an engineer in the room that know hardness of materials? Yeah, so you know, hardness of materials, what matters. It changes the, you know, the stress on the material. So I have a load cell, reactionary. Customer sends dev a device in. They, they say, use your adapters. Then they don't get the results that they want. So they say, oh, we'll send it back in with our adapters. Strength of the material. The, the, the material that's stronger is going to make that load cell deflect more. And when it deflects more, it's going to be different than the softer material. In this situation, uh, the error was 0.3 on something that was expected to be 0.025%. So considerable. And then this last example here is, you, you know, this, this goes back to purchasing somebody buying something because it's cheap. That's being load cells. Most of them are made in China. There are a lot made in America. But they're cheap. So purchasing sees us, ah, we'll buy this. This will be enough to check our press. But if we don't get that alignment absolutely perfect on this type of device, it's a $300 device compared to an $800 device, just to put it in perspective. If we do not get that alignment perfect, that error, just the slightest bit of misalignment, has a 0.752% error. So rather large. And then here's another one with thread depth. Again, we're, we're getting into you know, stresses and strains. Here's another one. Uh, this one, a customer sent us the device and said, just use your equipment. And then we measured it, like what they might use in the field versus what they might not use in the field. And that was a difference of 59.2 pounds uh, when the expectation is better than uh, 0.025. So, this is, again, when people test these things, when they test gusset plates and everything else that's further down the chain, do you trust it if the person that they've contracted to do that is just varying their adapters with these large errors? It's producing a lot more risk. And that's, that's really why I'm here, you know, just to talk about that, to talk about that risk. I don't want everybody to, you know, not sleep at night, but, you know, this stuff, this happens. Um, too late, yeah. You know, I will say that, you know, Boeing's under a lot of criticism for the 737 MAX. We all know that. Um, there are some issues there. But those planes are tested. When you, when you actually speak to them and the amount of testing they do and the pilots, you can, you can look online. They do things where they stall in midair. You can see their hairs going up. They're laughing. They, they just poke. They kind of poke where they're going to crash, almost poke to where they're going to crash that plane. And then when planes do crash, they're sent to seven laboratories to verify whether it was structural error or human error. You know, so there, there, there is a very, very good testing regimen on, on aircraft, what they have to comply by. Um, this, there's different stories with, with Boeing, of course, now in that 737 MAX, but there's also, some people in here remember the DC-10? There was a single point failure with the DC-10 after, after they kept, they, uh, what, what would basically happen is they'd take the engine off and they'd service it and they'd put it back on. Well, that single point failure was the piece where they keep re removing and putting it back on, and they found that out after, I think, the first crash. So it just... Um, it's just something that happens. People design things. And we know it. If you're in the room designing and somebody wants to change the initial design, that happened with um, the, a walkway, I think, in uh, Missouri, if it was. Yeah. yeah, Kansas City. It happened with a walkway in Kansas City. It was, it was, there was a design meeting and they changed the plans. So, and then hey, that, that collapsed and killed 100 some people. It didn't need to happen. So, next time you're in a meeting or you're talking about things being tested, start really thinking about who is doing that. Do I trust them? You know, how do I know they're making the right measurement? So, I don't know. It's probably not going to be us because they're probably gonna, you're probably going to use the people that we do business for or people that other people do business for. Because, like I said, we're high up on that pyramid. Um, we disseminate the unit of force properly. I like to think properly to all of industry. We are a global company. Uh, we do only about you know five uh, five to ten percent of our business, depending on the year overseas. But it's ninety percent. And locally, we have a few customers, but not many people need us locally. If you have a press, you want to know um, the force, uh, you know the downward force of it. You know we can do that. We can, we can sell instrumentation to do that. But you know different people use different things. So with that said. Um, that's about it. I want to take time for questions. I turned my computer off. I'm hoping I don't have any 
two minutes for questions. That always cracks me up for those that do not see it. I, I always like to end with some electric gaff, no outlet. That's, <laughs> oh, yeah, we also have an app. There's things we did not talk about, like mass and, and weighing and this and that. So the simplest thing with mass is I always, I always joke, doctor says lose weight. I said, I'm just going to move to Denver. So <laughs> that's my way. Then I, then I can keep drinking beer. So, but yeah, so questions. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for your time. It is valuable. Um, so anybody have questions? I'd love to answer them. So yes. You like the WD-40 and the duct tape? That's. Uh, <laughs> Sure. Well, since we signed the Treaty of the Meter and everything to SI, every, um, it's 2,000 newton meters, which is roughly 1474 um, pounds feet. And I specifically said pounds feet because people like to say foot pound. That's a unit of energy. I can, I can like I said, I'm loquacious. I can talk all day on, on this stuff and get me going. But it really peeves me when people say, yeah, I got this wrench, it's got foot pounds. No, it's pound feet. The manufacturers are dummies. Uh, they do that because people are dummies. No one ever says meter newtons, you know, in your engineering courses. No one said, hey, what's a meter newton of that? No, so it's newton meters. So, yes, thank you for the question. So, anyone else? Yes? Can you give us a sense of the scope and scale of your business and the economic impact in your county? Economic, oh, that's a good question. I don't, I do not know. We employ 23 people. Okay. So that's economic impact in, in York. We teach uh, several people per year. I last went down to Florida, talked to about taught 70 people uh, on, on mass comparator measurements. Um, through, that was done through NIST, which was, which was really cool. Um, economic impact, we're about six and a half million dollars sales, like I said, with, with five to ten percent going international, just depending on who's buying what. Uh, Indian, Shaw Indian Space Center bought, bought our equipment to, to, to calibrate their load cells, which then calibrates their thrust, thrust stands, which then they use those thrust strands, stands, of course, to try to get someone on the moon. So when the first you know, uh, Indian person is on the moon, that will be probably part of, we'll have a piece of that. You know, um, we've done that in the 60s. Business has been around forever. The, just what, what no one has asked, and I want to elaborate, is when you're in business for, you know, almost 100 years, it's tough to, you know, some parts are just obsolete, and that's always one that we deal with. You know, some people have been using our equipment, some of them, for 60, 70 years, and the engineers know everything has a fatigue life. So I get scared that, you know, things are going to break eventually. A million load cycles, 10 million, 60, 70 years, that's it's approaching. But yeah, more questions. So, yes? How, how do you mitigate your risk? Okay, obviously, you're in the economic chain. If there's a failure and it's your equipment, how do you protect your company? Excellent, excellent question. Because that just goes into what I was speaking about. Yeah, um, we send out things about fatigue life and, and, and ratings and, and really have the one-on-one -on -one with our customers. Our, fortunately, our equipment has not failed. We've had near misses, for sure. Uh, we've had misses in our lab where we pulled apart something that, you know, after 10,000 load cycles when it was for 100,000. You know, being in business for the 100 years, we're using pieces that we made 30 years ago, and when that happened, we threw them all out. We said, you know what, 30 years ago, documentation wasn't as good. The, the formulas for stress analysis, you know, People didn't have the slide rule then, but you know the slide rule was just just had 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 gotten out in the in the 70s. So what we do, we just we do we redesign the equipment. And on a note to that, when when people do do designs and they don't test, it is so easy to get a plus or a minus wrong. You get a plus or minus wrong in that, it'll tell you you're good to go. And if you don't test and you don't know, that item may break. So one more one more question. What? No. Done? No more questions. <laughs> Boo! Get me off, so. No, thank you.